Hello everyone. I'm recording this today from a, uh, a rather misty day here in Manchester for you. Um, today we're going to be talking about corals as long as nothing comes to get me out of the fog. That was a 1980s horror film reference, just FYI. In fact, there are several horror films based around fog. There's Drunk Arms of the Fog and there's The Mist, which has a very depressing ending. But there you go. Um, that's not all we're going to be talking about today. Today we are going to be talking about corals. So I hope this will be interesting. This is the uh, the next instalment in uh, Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils for you. And I'm sure you know the drill by now in terms of how this is going to pan out. So we're going to be starting by looking at the, um, by introducing the corals and looking at their biology. So without further ado, I will dive right into that. The first key question we can ask ourselves here is what is a coral? So usefully, I can tell you that corals are cnidarians. Hmm, it's not so useful, is it? We'll learn what that means exactly in the next slide. They're actually a members of a class of the um, cnidarians, as we'll learn in a bit. They are marine animals. They lack bilateral symmetry. Um, and today we tend to associate them, though um, not necessarily correctly, with coral reef environments. So they actually tend to be colonies of many individuals, polyps, um, when we find them in coral reefs. And each polyp secretes an exoskeleton near their base. So they've got some hard bits and they've got some soft bits as well. Uh, the corals as a whole have one opening through which they do everything, so they don't have a through gut. That's a, uh, a thing that defines the broader group of which they are a part. Some of them are predators. They catch small organisms using their tentacles. However, many others today, at least, are known for their association with um, a form of photosynthetic uni unicellular algae. So they uh, rely on light to provide energy in many cases. Again, that's specifically today, um, argument rages about whether that was the case back um, deep into the uh, fossil record. So as a result of this relationship with those algae though, we can say that again today, they are generally associated with shallow waters. Although some deep water forms do exist and they certainly did in the geological past. Um, as animals, they can reproduce both asexually and sexually. Um, they've got an interesting life cycle. And today, uh, we're going to be kind of dividing them into three major groupings, which I ho hope by, um, by dividing them up like this and uh, addressing them each under this, in each grouping, um, it will help you uh, understand some of the diversity that we may be looking at in this group and indeed what we're seeing in the fossil record. So I've put examples of these three major groups of corals whose uh, distribution varies through time on this slide. On the left, you can see some members of the rugose corals here. These are members of the order rugosa, so the rugose corals. In the middle, you can see some examples of tabulate corals. So those are members of the subclass or order, depending on which taxonomy you follow, tabulata. Um, so rugose, tabulate. Both of these groups are now extinct. So any living uh, corals that you come across will be members of this group that's shown on the right here. And these are the order Scleractinia. Um, these are the um, organisms, the corals that are still around building reefs today. Cool. So that's the three groupings. But I, I really usefully define them for you by saying corals and Idarians. That doesn't really cut it, does it, as, as definitions go. Um, and so I wanted to highlight what Nidarians were um, before moving on or moving back to the coral. So cnidarians um, include, is a grouping of animals that includes the sea anemones, the jellyfish and the corals. It's actually a clade. It's split off from the animal lineage prior to those animals that have bilateral symmetry. And as a result, you can identify these creatures as sharing a radial body plan. They're kind of circular rather than being bilaterally symmetrical. And as I've already mentioned, they have just one opening for both ingestion and excretion and in fact, everything else that they do. Um, underlying this kind of fairly simple arrangement as an animal is a fairly um, simple, I suppose it's safe to say, that's not fair, it's not simple, but a, a less complex um, 
form of anatomy than we see in other animals in that they comprise just two layers of cells. And these layers of cells hold a jelly-like material between them. By comparison, bilaterian animals like you and me and anything else that has bilateral symmetry actually have three fundamental cell layers that form fairly on in the development of their embryo. Uh, so these creatures really um, have no specialized organs and only a few different tissue types, but they have a higher grade of organization than, for example, organisms like sponges. So we're, we're kind of scrabbling uh, around here um, at the base of the animal tree. Not that that means anything, because obviously they have evolved for just as long, if you're looking at ones today, as every other animal has. But uh, nevertheless, they split off fairly early from the animal lim lineage. Uh, they have two basic life strategies. You can often find members of the Cnidaria as polyps. Um, so these are usually sessile or attached to uh, the substrate in some way. And the other life strategy is as uh, what we call medusae. These are forms that swim, trailing tentacles. You can see examples of the medusae on the left here and polyps on the right here. And these are actually really similar structures. If you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? It just depends where you, you know, which, how you live your life, where you attach yourself. This end here could easily be this end that attaches to the substrate in those forms. And indeed, I've put this image in here just to highlight, A, that they have really cool life cycles, but B, that many of these organisms will actually undergo uh, both forms of um, life strategy over the course of their lifetime. So they off will often go through a polyp stage and then go through a medusa stage prior to um, reproduction. So that's really, really interesting. Writ large, generally, uh, that's very much an, uh, you know, uh, an assumption, not an assumption, I'm very much, uh, I'm ignoring some exceptions, but the uh, Cnidarians are generally carnivores, attacking a range of prey items using poisonous stinging cells. These are things called Cnidoblasts, FYI. Um, indeed, uh, Cnidarian uh, translates to nettle bearers, and that's because of these cells. So that's the Cnidarians as a whole, and just as a reminder, what we're looking at is the corals, which are a subgroup of the Cnidarians. But I thought it would be interesting just to highlight um, that this group exists for you. So when you um, see things that we traditionally think of as jellyfish in the sea, those are all going to be Cnidarians. Same with sea anemones. So the next obvious thing to ask is where do they sit on the tree of life? And indeed, this isn't going to be too challenging for us because I've just introduced the Cnidarians and here they are. As you can see, these are the Cnidarians share a common ancestor with the Bilaterians at some point in the geological past, um, probably some, somewhere in the Ediacaran or very earliest Cambrian, um, but more likely Ediacaran period. And taxonomically, um, this group is a bit more messy, as you can see here. So the Cnidaria are a phylum. Uh, so the things that we call corals are included in a class called the Anthozoa. This comes from the Greek word anthos for flower and zoa for animals. So it literally means flower animals, which is pretty cool, I think. And the Anthozoa is a grouping that includes the sea anemones, the stony corals and the soft corals. So the things that we're talking about today are generally the stony corals. I say generally, they're exclusively stony corals. And this means that actually we can say that the things that we're looking at today are actually a, the members of a subclass of the anthozoa called the hexocoralia. So hexocoralia. These are um, corals that all lack this medusoid stage. Uh, living forms possess polyps with hollow tentacles and they're found in both solitary and colonial forms. So colonial forms like we see in a reef, solitary forms living on their own. The other subclasses that you find in the Anthozoa, just FYI, are a grouping that includes the soft corals and the sea pens, and one called the tube dwelling anemones, which are not that closely related to sea anemones, confusingly. Um, so just so you know, there are those two other subclasses, but today we're talking about Hexocoralia, um, and we can say that there are around 12 orders within this subclass, and there are more than that 
um, that are members of the class Anthozoa as a whole. So 12 orders within the subclass and then a whole load of other orders in those other subclasses, FYI. And there are at least 6,200 species of Anthozoan alive today. But bear in mind that many more of these will be extinct. So, the next obvious question to ask is how are these distributed through time? Now, they're relatively um, common as fossils, or at least I associate them with sedimentary rocks wherever they are alive. Um, in, in part, this is because they have good preservation potential and they tend to form large structures, for example, reefs. And so actually, um, finding uh, corals within the, in field work is not unusual in the, slight, in the slightest. But generally, certainly more recently, we've only find these under certain water conditions, and we'll get onto that in lecture three. Bear in mind though, as you can see very clearly from this graph, that both tabulate and rugose corals went extinct at the Permo-Triassic extinctions. So if you find a coral, um, and you're looking in Paleozoic rocks, it's almost certainly going to be a tabulate or a rugos coral. There are a few other really small groups that don't quite fit into this, um, this distinction that appear quite late in the Paleozoics, so let's ignore those. Early in the order Vishna through to the Silurian, tabulate corals were actually more successful than rugos corals. As the Paleozoic bumbles along, and certainly into the Devonian and the Carboniferous, Rugos corals become this, the, 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 the kind of the, the more successful groups, and it's those that you find in the fossil record uh, more frequently than tabulate corals, at least based on my fieldwork experience in the UK. At least, though, um, the fact that these went extinct and then the Scleractinian corals appear relatively soon after the Permo-Triassic extinction means that if you find a coral and you're working in a Mesozoic or later rock, it's almost certainly going to be a Scleractinian or one of a few very closely related now extinct orders. So, as a first principle, uh, Paleozoic, Rugos or Tabulate, and I will show you in the next video how to differentiate those. Um, and if it's post-Paleozoic, you're looking most likely at a Scleractinian coral. Now, saying that, we can actually look in a bit more detail about how these are distributed through time. So we can say that coral-like forms have been described from the Cambrian, but their exact affinities are hard to pin down. So we first really see things we can definitively say are tabulate corals in the early Ordovician period. And by the mid and late Ordovician, the typical tabulate characters had evolved. And these, these guys and girls, that's not even, that's not a valid thing to say at all. These, these don't have the, I don't have guys and girls. So let's ignore that. But these creatures dominated coral faunas. The Rugos corals appear in the mid Ordovician. In within this group, you can see a general trend um, independently in, in multiple groups um, towards uh, having more complex, heavier skeletons with kind of a more complex structure. And that's a trend that's repeated across lineages, probably convergently. So that's the Rugos there. The first Sclerictinians that's these creatures here, appear in the middle Triassic. And these were probably already photosymbiotic. That means that they had already developed that relationship they have with algae, allowing them to, um, to make, uh, make energy from sunlight by co-opting the energy created by the algae. They often formed patch reefs in tropical seas. The group expanded significantly after the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. And there were radiations in both shallow water forms, so that's the reef building colonial types typically, and in deep water environments. So those are solitary forms of scleroctylian coral that are generally not reef building. And within this group, within the scleroctinia through time, we see evolution within the colonial forms towards increasing integration. So they become better as colonial organisms working together to build these reefs. 
as time goes on. So that's this kind of uh, that's two, some broad patterns of coal evolution. And as with previous lectures, I wanted to finish by highlighting um, why they matter, and then looking at how that has varied through time. So they matter in terms of um, environments, uh, the environment today, in that corals form reefs. So reefs are carbonate bodies built up mainly by framework building benthic organisms. Corals are one example of that. So there are reefs that aren't necessarily associated with corals, but typically the biggest, the chunkiest ones, um, of which you can see some examples in this image here, are built by corals. And coral reefs are really vital, uh, vitally important today. Corals are the key structural component building these. These coral reefs are found only in the tropics. So they're found in a zone extending approximately from 30 degrees north to 30 degrees south of the equator. Reef forming corals, because of this relationship with algae, um, do not grow at greater than 100 meters in depth or where the water temperature falls below 18 degrees Celsius. Indeed, they grow best in warm, shallow, clear, sunny and agitated water. Um, things like sediment input are generally a bad time for the corals. Um, I would also highlight, and I don't talk about this uh, really over the course of the lecture at all, that they also struggle with um, really abnormally high temperatures, and that's why many uh, corals and coral reefs are really struggling at the moment due to anthropogenic climate change. It really is a significant deal, something to worry about. And the fact that these are struggling is something to worry about because coral reef ecosystems are some of Earth's most diverse. As an example, Coral reefs make up less than 1% of the world's ocean floor by um, surface area, but they're home to 25%, a quarter of all marine species. This is something I got off um, the website of the Coral Reef Alliance um, because I was a unable to find a paper that um, successfully managed to actually come up with specific figures on that. So take that for what it's worth. But they are these hotspots of um, diversity. They're often called the rainforests of the sea. As another example, uh, the Great Barrier Reef contains over 400 coral species, 1,500 fish species, 4,000 mollusk species, and six of the world's seven sea turtle species. So they really are important. But they're important to us not just because they are these hotspots of diversity, but because they matter to our economy as well. So the estimated global value that um, coral reefs give humans is £6 trillion every year due in part to their contribution to fishing and tourism industries, and because they provide coastal protection. They stop um, large waves hitting our coasts. More than 500 million people worldwide depend on reefs for food, jobs, and coastal defense. So they're really, really important to humanity as a whole. So that's something about coral reefs today and why they matter today. I wanted to finish by highlighting that they're also important in deep time. Reefs have existed in diff to differing degrees throughout the Phanerozoic, but the key organisms that um, have made reefs have changed with time. And I've put an example um, in this diagram on the right here that shows you how that has happened. So you can see at different times we've had tabulate and regose corals contributing heavily to reefs, but also in the Paleozoic we had um, uh, organisms including algae um, and indeed sponges and bryozoa contributing to reef ecosystems. Um, since the uh, Mesozoic hit, we've really um, gone into a realm where we have sclerotinian corals being the predominant reef builder, and they're very, very good at it, but only under certain conditions. Whereas still, in conditions that aren't ideal for corals, <clears throat> we can have reefs, but they tend to be formed by, for example, algae, sponges, or other organisms with occasional forays into, for example, the rudists, which we um, talked about in our bivalves lecture. So reefs are an important thing in the fossil record through geological time, but they're not always, though they often are, associated with corals. 
We can typically think of reefs today, and probably in many instances, at least more recently in the geological past, as constructing three or, or as um, existing in kind of three main types of what we call intergradational reefs. These are fringing and barrier reefs and atolls. And I want to highlight the development um, which I've shown, shown on the left here. Now these form often around volcanic islands. Volcanic islands will uh, appear out of the sea. And then a fringing reef will often develop directly adjacent to the land areas where the sea hits the volcanic island. <clears throat> With time, that will stop growing and isostatic readjustment will occur. The um, entire volcanic island if this will start to sink. Um, and eventually, that will then form a barrier reef. This is when you have a uh, reef with an intervening lagoon between the land. As this continues to isostatically readjust and sink, eventually, you leave, um, you get to a situation where you may no longer be able to see the volcanic foundations of this reef, this reef ecosystem. The reef will continue to grow as the volcanic island subsides, <clears throat> and eventually all you'll be left with is a reef enclosing a lagoon. So that's the state of play when you have an atoll. So that's a quick overview of how these things, um, how um, reefs tend to form today and in the geological record. And I wanted to finish by highlighting that before the Ordovician, reefs were often microbial in nature. Think of things like stromatolites. These are um, structures that are left when cyanobacteria grow upwards towards the sunlight. There was a major change in the early to mid Ordovician when metazoan, so animal reefs, became much more, more common. And indeed, in the Paleozoic shallow marine ecosystems, uh, we tend to see um, microbes, bryozoic corals, and sponges building reefs. So corals are not necessarily the foremost reef builders that they are today. Um, but in stressed environments in the Paleozoic, such as, um, for example, uh, places where you have lots and lots of um, salt, so say hypersaline environments, and after extinctions, we still get those stromatolite-based um, reefs. So it's a sign of a stressed environment. In the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, as I've already mentioned, reefs are characterized by sclerotinian corals. And sclerotinian corals are really, really good reef-building organisms, and they've evolved to be such. However, bear in mind that also during these periods of the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, you can get stressed environments in which corals will not live. Corals are really quite particular about the environments they, they live in. And while occasionally you may still find stromatolites in these, um, these environments, actually uh, metazoan reefs uh, have developed in stressed environments since the PT extinction. So in, in the Mesozoic and more recently, when you have a stressed environment, uh, you tend to get reefs that are marked by either serp or that are created by either circulid worms or oysters. So actually, um, as we look through time, we can see that not only do the um, the constituent creatures that build reefs change through time, that's also linked to the environment in which these reefs were developing. And so there's this nice complex picture of reef systems developing through time that I wanted to highlight there. So with that brings me to the end of this particular video and I'll see you in a few minutes for video number two when we have a look at some of the morphology and the anatomy of some of these corals. So I'll see you in a second.